Um, my presentation is going a little bit off from my original uh, written remarks uh, to address key questions related to the intersection between uh, worker control and cooperatives and labor unions or trade unions. And I'd like to start first by uh, making uh, the point that cooperatives and uh, worker councils and uh, forms of democratic representation in the workplace uh, do not emerge rapidly and nothing really in social life emerges rapidly and we can see examples of cooperatives and labor unions existing side by side if necessary and I think that's what the future bodes. Uh, there's a possibility for trade unions to engage in uh, cooperation with uh, well cooperatives uh, and uh, to represent workers in cooperatives uh, I, I see that as a possibility and also to um, represent workers who are employed in uh, private enterprises. I think it's important uh, to note also that uh, hopefully this discussion will build on the preceding uh, points that were made last night as well as those that were made in the first session and uh, prior to my discussion here. Um, so I, in some ways, think we need to look at um, capitalist development and see how cooperatives themselves have emerged within the process, how um, capitalism has in itself uh, brought about this desire amongst workers to achieve a form of democracy within the workplace. Um, and I think that we've gone in some ways full circle. Obviously, uh, we look at capitalism, we have to look at it from the two sides. One is the uh, point that is related to um, the new technologies that are developed or have been developed over the last 250 years, rooted in Newtonian science initially, and uh, moving on now to nanotechnology and beyond that have eroded the lives of workers um, and their living standards over and over again. And the very fact that workers have existed um, uh, in a economy that is rooted in a social for formation that is not necessarily entirely capitalist, that we have capitalist forms of uh, social relations uh, within, between managers and workers, between corporations and workers, and we have pre-capitalist uh, models, and I think we can learn something from recognizing that certainly the rise of capitalism has contributed to higher levels of um, income and to a certain degree prosperity, but also has eroded people's lives in many instances. Um, primarily through the extraction of surplus value, something that uh, Rick talked about yesterday, uh, through uh, in volume three, but also in volume one of, of capital, uh, the exploitation of workers, extraction of surplus value, reinvestment of surplus value w within uh, new uh, enterprises. Uh, unions, uh, trade unions, cannot do anything, at least in the United States and most parts of the world, uh, to stop capitalists from uh, reinvesting uh, their profits uh, that were made uh, at the hands of the workers uh, in new technology and in lower wage labor. And so I think that we really uh, need to understand uh, a form for formulation rooted in a class struggle form of unionism, one that is willing to resist um, capital and corporate domination uh, both on the shop floor and with respect to collective bargaining if that exists. Um, but also uh, on the basis of the economy as a whole. Um, and so I think it's extremely important to recognize that cooperatives have um, a long-standing uh, history, uh, something that I would refer to as something that's integral to uh, working class aspirations, um, 
that go back for 150 years to 200 years at least. Um, so I'd like to start that with this very notion that uh, comes into play uh, increasingly in the capitalist world, uh, and that is the, the fact that when we look at the formation and consolidation of trade unions, in the first phases of those unions, uh, we had a system in which workers were initiating uh, these formations, obviously out of artisanal, arsenial uh, forms, um, but um, they were transformed into mass production industries and so forth. Um, so I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to link uh, the relationship between uh, changes in new technologies, uh, changes in corporate and capitalist efforts to extract uh, greater profit from their enterprises um, and uh, worker resistance to those forms of enterprises uh, uh, that uh, extract surplus value. And I think it's extremely important to, to note that um, one of the key features that has promotive, promoted uh, worker control if we call it cooperatives or other uh, entities, is the very fact that uh, capitalist economies produce uncertainty and workers are uh, uh, very much uh, interested in maintaining that certainty um, and are losing in this battle, I think, at this point. And, and so we can start from the very beginning of the intentional communities that were formed in the uh, uh, mid-19th century, as well as uh, the utopian communities that were so much flourishing during this period of time into the early 20th century and even beyond. Um, and what were the major goals of a cooperative society? First of all, it was anti-capitalist, and I think that's very important to recognize. Uh, there was a notion that was rooted within uh, worker cooperation uh, that, in fact, workers had the uh, tools of production themselves initially, they had the knowledge to create uh, production, and uh, they also uh, could increasingly, if they organized, engage in uh, not just production, but distribution and circulation of uh, goods and services within society. And we have many examples that are drawn from the United States, but North America, Europe, and throughout the world where workers are, in fact, engaged in these kind of cooperative communities. But let me uh, focus uh, on the United States um, in this historical context. Um, the United States has a uh, highly uh, robust and rich history of worker control that is rooted in the early foundations of capitalism and also the forms of social movements that were organized in the 19th century, both in the rural and urban areas. I think we can see that divide uh, both in rural areas uh, as well as in urban areas. Uh, as well, we can look at it through uh, different uh, geographic areas uh, in uh, the, the U.S. Um, in the uh, 1870s and 1880s, it was the working class themselves that organized uh, in rural areas uh, the populist movement, uh, one that uh, sought to control the distribution of uh, uh, seeds, crops, as well as its transportation through the foundation and formation of worker cooperatives. Um, and that um, in many instances, uh, farmers uh, in the 1870s, when the United States and most of the world uh, had an agrarian economy, um, workers in the United States, and I think we could actually use the term farmers as workers in this context, were unable to afford uh, credit uh, to pay for seeds and supplies on the, uh, uh, from the perspective of farming um, and at the same time they were not able to control the distribution system so uh, the populist movement which has a rich history of some 30 to 35 years uh, 
and uh, Lawrence Goodwin has written extensively about this, uh, congealed into a number of movements that uh, potentially had uh, political, uh, not potentially, but actually had political ramifications in the United States in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, in fact, the Democratic Party uh, presidential uh, candidate was a uh, member of the populist movement um, in 1892 and 1896. Um, so the uh, whole idea was to ensure that prices would be reduced at the um, purchasing level for the, uh, so to speak, means of production that people could grow seeds and so forth and obtain supplies and also from the perspective of distribution through uh, promo promoting higher commodity prices. Because if there was only one trust that was a uh, capitalist trust that was engaged in the distribution of crops and so forth, workers had no control over how that distribution of wages would uh, take place. And I think we frequently uh, ignore the fact that um, uh, throughout most of uh, the history of even capitalism, it's a rural process and not only an uh, urban process. That has changed, uh, obviously, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, in the urban areas, I think uh, it's very important to note that uh, the f formation of the Knights of Labor in the United States in the 1880s uh, was rooted in the notion that uh, worker cooperatives would uh, replace capitalist uh, enterprises uh, everywhere. And so the Knights of Labor in the United States did not agree to any form of collective bargaining, um, something that continued under other unions uh, that uh, existed during that time. They fought against lower wages and they fought against high employment and unemployment and a reserve army of labor, um, and they fought uh, to promote uh, uh, the value of worker skills, something that, uh, as we, uh, everyone's talked about, capitalists continuously to try, try to undermine. Um, in fact, at its uh, height in the 1880s, the uh, Knights of Labor had over 200 industrial cooperatives uh, that were uh, thriving at that time. Uh, but so suddenly, in the uh, late 1880s, they, uh, they ceased to exist, primarily because of uh, reconstruction in the United States and the consolidation of power of uh, the business class uh, after a series of uh, elections and the growth of the uh, Gilded Age in, in the United States. And so by the early 20th century, we have a consolidation of corporate rule in the United States, uh, and a decline of uh, workplace democracy almost in its entirety. Um, and so what is to replace the Knights of Labor, uh, which was a union and yet at the same time did not agree to collective bargaining? Uh, and the American Federation of Labor, which has um, a checkered history in its initial stages um, and I think continues to this day, um, had to address issues of uh, representing uh, skilled laborers, but were not so much interested in those uh, workers who were part of the mass production industries. Uh, one of the errors that is frequently uh, missing in uh, histories uh, in the United States uh, for probably political reasons is the uh, foundation of the industrial workers of the world in uh, 1905. Uh, that was rooted in a notion of uh, multiracial, uh, multi, no, well, um, a, 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 a very strong uh, appeal to anti-racism, uh, gender equality, and uh, efforts to also uh, prevent workers from competing against one another. The IWW2, which is also a global movement uh, in Europe, Australia, uh, and elsewhere, South Africa, uh, was a movement that uh, did not agree to bargaining at all, 
And yet the tactics and strategies of the IWW uh, were rooted in a anarcho-syndicalist notion that, well, we're just living in capitalism now and that if we only can uh, defeat the uh, corporate classes, we will um, allow ourselves to, and the working classes, uh, to achieve um, socialism. I, I, I think there's no question about, about it that anarcho-syndicalists uh, in the early 20th century believed that socialism was possible. And they believed that socialism was uh, rooted in a notion of educating the working class uh, as well as uh, the idea that if uh, workers were able to gain uh, control through direct action and other forms of uh, collective activities, they would achieve socialism. Uh, and that this ideology and this sense that workers had uh, laid the basis for the mass industrial protest movements of the 1930s uh, that were rooted in contractual unionism. Yet at the same time, I think it's also important to recognize that um, the movements of the 1930s also believed that they could achieve, a, at least the workers felt, I think, that they could achieve socialism by getting a union contract. And that obviously is not the case. And I don't think it is, will ever be the case. Anyway, there's a litany of stories and very long ones that I can provide with respect to marginal workers in the IWW, um, you know, hobos uh, to people who are working in t turpentine uh, plantations and so forth that organize themselves to uh, at least live a better life. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that today we frequently talk about uh, marginalized workers uh, or precarious workers today. And this is not something new. Uh, this is something that has existed for uh, at least 150 to 200 years and certainly before that in different contexts. Um, what, what were cooperatives doing at this time? That might be a question that I wanted to raise briefly that the United States has a very robust system of cooperatives that existed uh, in different phases uh, to a greater or lesser extent and continue to do so today. But we should be very clear about what the objectives are and we also should be very clear about what, who, who's being represented by, by cooperatives. We can have, for instance, people who are in buildings and who are living in cooperatives that are uh, highly affluent people. So. Ironically, it's in some cases, those people who are the most affluent are uh, benefiting from cooperative associations. Um, I think that uh, the, because I know time is limited, uh, the, the probably apogee of the American uh, working class movement, it really is limited, so I'll just quickly go on, uh, was in the 1930s when we had uh, mass uh, worker takeovers, which were uh, put to a halt by the um, U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. government. Uh, I, for one, and I think many others, would agree that the United States is a capitalist state and it cannot be changed electorally. And um, one of the interesting anecdotes is that workers did not feel that um, they uh, that they did not feel that the unions could stop them from seizing control of the industries. Uh, yet at the same time, the unions had uh, turned into the overseers, at least in the United States in most cases, with a few uh, exceptions to the rule, very few, um, uh, and bureaucrats and intermediaries and beneficiaries of uh, working class and rank and file uh, power. Um, that came to an end in the 1960s in the United States uh, with uh, the end of Fordism, the rise of post-Fordism, the resistance that was extremely intense uh, in the United States through the rank and file movement in the steel industry, in the mining industry, and uh, in the docks and a, a number of other critical um, uh, manufacturing segments as well as uh, distribution segments of the economy. So you have a continuation of resistance. Uh, 
I'd, I'd like to say a few points about cooperatives in my few moments left. Um, one is that um, what has been said so far, how do you uh, create a cooperative uh, within the context of a capitalist uh, logic of production and distribution and capitalism? Um, in, uh, I think today's movements are learning from the lessons of the failures of cooperatives of the 1970s and 80s and 90s, by that which time most of them had uh, ceased to exist. Because if you take a look at the average enterprise, even capitalist enterprise, it doesn't have a very long lifespan. Uh, that it, you know, small businesses especially, they're lucky to, li to exist for five years. Why should a cooperative be any longer? Well, they should, they are frequently uh, have a longer uh, existence, primarily because um, uh, they do not reinvest in new uh, enterprises and so forth, and the profits are reinvested in the firm, and this is one of the primary uh, advantages of cooperative movements. Um, and so I would argue that we really need to overcome the mistakes of the past uh, in understanding uh, how cooperatives can uh, advance um, in uh, the United States, however you want to call them, cooperatives or uh, worker control, uh, forms and so forth, or workers' councils even. Um, I, I think that... Uh, oh, yeah, I should... I should start. Oh, yeah, so, uh, so what is the strategy for the early 21st century? Um, I actually uh, probably will put, will put this down because I... The strategy in the early 21st century is one in which uh, uh, most cooperatives have uh, given up on uh, capitalist uh, formations, but I think it's also in terms of investment, uh, the whole notion of micro lending as being a possibility in promoting them. Um, uh, yet at the same time, there I think we can't say every cooperative is equal or the same and operates in the same way as we cannot say every trade union does, uh, because trade unions are very different from one another. How many more minutes do I have? Two, Two minutes? Okay. Um, so, for instance, uh, we have trade unions that um, uh, exist uh, through uh, maintaining a very strong uh, form of uh, control in a shop steward system over their members, and they dictate the policies. Uh, I think the United Auto Workers provides a very interesting example today. Uh, it has a, a legacy that's storied uh, and very important rooted, in, you know, founded in the Flint sit-down strikes, yet at the same time, over the years, uh, the, uh, the union declined dramatically to the point today, which I think it really is important to recognize and to think about, at least, and have a discussion about, and that is that the UAW is a owner, a co-owner of uh, uh, General Motors and Chrysler Corporation, which is now also owned by Fiat. And in that context, uh, who is the UAW? Are they the representatives of the managers? I think so. I mean, if you were to ask most workers who are making $14 an hour, uh, I, don't, I guess that would be about 10 pounds, uh, 10 euros an hour, uh, working on the uh, assembly lines without health benefits, uh, they are very angry and they do not consider themselves owners of the company, even, even if they have a stake of 10 or 20 percent. And I think that's important to, uh, to recognize. And also to recognize that, and this I, I think is rooted in the notion of bureaucracies and the ways in which bureaucracies control workers and uh, the absolute inevitability of workers to found their own democratic structures. And we, we do have examples of that. The United States, unfortunately, is not the best case study uh, the most successful and largest unions are the ones that have the weakest linkages to their own rank and file workers and engage in agreements with the employers to strike uh, deals in which they'll enlarge their membership. Um, just getting back to the cooperatives in my one minute left, uh, I, I think it's very important, and it was made by uh, Walter uh, a few moments ago, uh, to uh, have both a uh, uh, kind of a 
positive as well as a critical eye toward uh, cooperatives. That on the one hand, cooperatives can uh, certainly create higher levels of um, democracy, and uh, yet at the same time, they also are subject to uh, internal and external uh, forms of disruption. Uh, I'd like to speak to you very briefly about the external ones uh, within the political context. Um, I don't think that uh, cooperatives can trust elected officials uh, at all. Um, I was recently approached uh, by the Speaker of the City Council of New York City uh, to engage in a discussion about worker cooperatives. I have to tell you, I didn't even call back or email back. Uh, yet uh, a group in New York City a, that runs cooperatives um, or it supports cooperatives did call back and the Speaker of the City Council of New York, Christine Quinn, uh, who otherwise is a uh, neoliberal uh, Democrat um, and who opposed uh, to provide uh, basic sanitary laws for uh, migrant workers in restaurants uh, uh, agreed to pay $150,000 to a cooperative that is called the Center for Family Life in New York City, which um, I, I think in some ways tells us that cooperatives are in some way are, are, are compelling to the political uh, elite uh, in the United States and elsewhere. They see this as a potential solution, but they want it on their own terms and um, by that I mean they want to take credit for it and they want these cooperatives to engage in uh, market mechanisms. Well, you know, obviously there are cooperatives that don't engage in uh, market uh, mechanisms. There are some es ESOPs that are not necessarily um, uh, selling off uh, their businesses or operated on the basis of productivity and uh, reinvestment in that uh, uh, one, one other issue in my 15 seconds I have left over or so is the whole notion of social reproduction and the questions that that raises. Uh, uh, just in summing up, I think that we now live in a world where uh, capitalism had originally promised that they, if you, so long as you worked and were gainfully employed, that it would cover the basic social reproductive needs of workers. And I think today we do not have that at all. I think we can go from industry to industry, from enterprise to enterprise. Increasingly those reproductive needs, healthcare, education, housing, uh, child rearing, etc., are, are, are being taken away from workers as part of the uh, restructuring of capitalism uh, and so forth. I, I don't want to take up more than my time, so I'll turn it over to the next speaker, Carl.